direct warning to those who listen to FUC on apologetics. This man is an absolute devil and I cannot stand his presence on YouTube and what he is doing to the body of Christ. I cannot stand the deception he is bringing upon the people who want to hear the gospel of grace. Hey guys, I just got this new Faith Alone translation. Oh. He is a minister of Satan disguising himself as a minister of righteousness. I'm going to share with you how to destroy the doctrine of once saved, always saved in less than five minutes. This man is dangerous. This man twists scripture to his own destruction and yours. What? This guy's trying to tell me we're saved by works and not by faith alone? <sighs> wow. You know what? Let me find that one verse that talks about faith alone. Let's see here. Oh, yep, there we go. James 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone? He is a religious Pharisee making his converts twice the child of hell that he is. I locked myself in a room and I said, uh, you know, that I wasn't going to come out until I was right with God. And I, I cried out to God for maybe 45 minutes. And he came to me and showed me this vision where he grabbed me and took me and dangled me off the side of a cliff. And down below was the lake of fire. And Adam, if you're listening to this, I want you to know I think you are absolute trash. And just like the trash in Jesus' time, you will be thrown in Gehenna if you don't repent now. A few months ago, Epiusion Apologetics, or Adam, put out a call to the Free Grace Movement asking that they explain consistently Hebrews 5. Not only did I accept that challenge, but I answered to it in great detail. And when I brought that argument to Adam's attention, he completely refused to watch it. He had no interest. He didn't have time. He had all the time to issue a challenge, just none of the time to hear it out. What I find to be even more sad is there are people within the conditional security movement that rose up and spoke out against him saying he was misusing this scripture. See, we not only have to believe the gospel, but we have to obey the gospel. That's why it says that many became obedient to the faith. When we're looking at that Greek word used there for obey, and we can look into it in depth, but that word obey is to listen to, to attend to. So despite both the eternal security camp and conditional security camp agreeing on the context of this verse, Adam himself decided to just reject it and then switch the narrative onto me as being somebody who was just bearing wicked fruit and just wanted to fight and just wanted to argue. And then I asked Adam, was John the Baptist bearing wicked fruit when he called the Pharisees a brood of vipers? Because that is exactly what I was doing. And of course I got blocked because when you make too much sense for a heretic, you need to be silenced because the truth will always stand against the lie and light will always outshine the darkness. By the grace of God, since that video, there have actually been a few people who were once subscribed to Adam who have now come over to this channel and learn more about the theological perspective that emphasizes the grace of God and acknowledges that there is nothing good in of ourselves that can save us or keep us saved. The joy that these people have been overwhelmed with has been amazing. Watching the bondage they were in break by the power of God has been absolutely amazing. And within this fellowship, we continue to build each other up, study the word of God, hold each other accountable, and exemplify love to one another. My heart broke the other night when I had somebody reach out to me in desperation, which was 11 o'clock my time, 5 o'clock a.m. their time, and they were just so desperate for answers because Adam had completely led them down to a road that left them in a state of despair, hopelessness, fear, to the point where this person wanted to take their life. Don't tell me that the gospel message that promises everlasting life is the same message you are preaching because the message you are preaching is a message of condemnation that is leading to fear and death.
there is only one person who interacted with Jesus who went and killed themselves after interacting with him and it was somebody who was specifically chosen by Jesus so that scripture could be fulfilled and that was Judas. When you look at how every other single person when they were confronted by Jesus and confronted in the midst of their sins was treated, they did not take it as an opportunity to fear Jesus. They went in told greatly about Jesus. You have the woman at the well when she was confronted about her numerous partners. She went into the city knowing that she was going to be judged for her sexual affairs, but she was just so enthralled by the greatness of Jesus. And she's like, look, come see a man who told me everything that I've done. Is this not the Messiah? What about the woman who was caught in adultery that Jesus advocated for in front of the religious leaders, spared her life, forgave her sins, and rose her up? from the ground. The problem with people like Adam is they hear grace and they immediately think of sin because they are so morally corrupt that they are so demonic that the first thing they think of when they think of the freedom that was purchased by the blood of Christ is a chance to go and live in licentiousness. And while you may take pride in each view you've received so far, just remember that is going to act as an account against you on Judgment Day. And I have seen one too many lives ruined at your hands. And if you think you are truly preaching the gospel of grace where people are ending up in trauma, counseling, in, on suicide hotlines, you are sadly mistaken. And when you look at the majority of the people that were told to repent, who were they? The law keepers, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the self-righteous people who were ignorant of the righteousness of God and went about to establish their own righteousness, which is exactly what you're doing. I want to take a look at a scripture that was told to me the other night by this individual that Adam apparently uses to teach that one can lose their salvation. That scripture comes from Philippians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mine earthly things. Quick question for you, Adam. Are you stupid or dumb? Because this scripture is talking about people like you. Let's go back to the beginning of the chapter so we can have clear context of what's going on. So verse one, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Uh, hello, brethren? Save people? Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Adam, you seem to have a lot of confidence in your flesh. You see, people, because what's going on here is Paul's talking against those Judaizers that are continuing to try to push the law upon people who are trying to push legalism upon people. And there is this whole debate that was going on in the early church of whether or not a Gentile needs to be circumcised. I'm convinced that if the Bible didn't explicitly have verse after verse after verse after verse about circumcision, Adam would be right out there with his knife, holding people in line, just waiting to take them one after another and get them circumcised. Because he clearly doesn't understand how the law was a shadow of good things to come, as Hebrew says. He clearly doesn't understand the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, as Galatians says. Adam, can you show me one circumcision that's ever been performed where the flesh is put on? Absolutely not. And that is the point. That is the image. That is the shadow. The physical circumcision was supposed to point to the spiritual reality that is the circumcision of the heart, us being cut off from our flesh, dwelled with the Holy Spirit. That is why Paul can say things that when he sins, it's not him that sins, but his flesh. And that is why as believers, we are encouraged to walk after the new man and not walk after the way of the old man. We are to consider him dead because he has been put on the cross with Christ who died for our sins, past, present, future. Colossians 2 also makes it very clear that it is 
all sins. And so Paul is trying to make the point how we are the circumcision because we have been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, as Colossians 2 says, as that circumcision we have been circumcised from our flesh. What? The circumcision acted as a sign of a spiritual circumcision, which shows that your flesh has been removed. So then Paul decides to rhetoric back and forth with people like Adam. And he says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So he's basically saying, you, you think you can trust in your flesh? I have more reason to trust in my flesh. And then he goes through his pedigree here circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin in a Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. So even though Paul has all these self-righteous works that he can boast in, he counts them as dung so he can win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is the doctrine of imputed righteousness, which is talked about in places like Romans 4, 2 Corinthians 5, even one of their favorite go-to chapters, James 2. It's like the Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Bible calls it the ministry of reconciliation. Some of the reformers refer to it as the great exchange. It is that a trade essentially occurs at the moment of trust, and that faith, that trusting in the gospel is what allows our sinful life to be imputed unto Christ at the cross, and his perfect life to be imputed on us by the grace of God. That is biblical grace. And Romans 5 makes it very clear that how do we have access to the grace of God? By faith. Going back to Romans 4. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And continuing in Romans 4, we see that the believer will not have sin imputed unto their account. Just like David described the blessedness of the man who the Lord will not impute sin. Because we are not under the law, we are under the grace of God. And that is why there are such stern warnings from Paul about using that grace as a license to go and sin. And he says, God forbid, that is not what I'm teaching. Continuing on in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection in the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I apprehend of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Who is he talking about? The self-righteous Judaizers. Then we get into this passage. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why are they the enemies of the cross of Christ? Because they have rejected him. They have more comfort in their own self-righteousness, their legalism, their law-keeping, just like you, Adam. Going on, we have whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mine earthly things. 
For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This man needs to be stopped and the people who are watching him need to be rescued. Here are the top five reasons why I believe the notion of once saved, always saved is false and should be avoided. This is a man-made doctrine. This doctrine wasn't created until the 1500s. Adam, I think you're an absolute devil. I think you are wicked. I think you are leading many people to hell. I'm not convinced that you're not aware of that. You can say whatever you want about me. You can question whatever you want about me. But at the end of the day, Adam, it wasn't you there the other night when this individual was so low, was it? Woe unto you, Adam, you hypocrite. He does not know the love of God and he does not understand the grace of God. If you want to see the video of me breaking down Adam's teaching, be sure to click here. And if you're not sure you're going to heaven, be sure to watch this video over here. If you're listening today and you do not know that you have eternal life, you're not absolutely sure that you're going to heaven when you die, then here's how simple that it is. God has concluded we all have sinned, that you and I. God has also said that he loves the sinner. And we find out in Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then in John 3, 16, God loved the world. He loves you. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. If you realize you're a sinner and Christ is a wonderful Savior and He died on that cross to save you from spending eternity in hell so you could have a home in heaven with Him, He bought your right to live with Him for all time and eternity. All He asked you to do is believe the record God gave of His Son, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved.